In this episode, we'll be teaching you how to camouflage. see here this is an example of what you don't want in the field I have here shiny boots I have bright colors on my arm and I'm wearing a beret there are five really key things to remember when you are doing camouflage concealment firstly the shape and roundness of the helmet the shadow of the helmet rim the shape of equipment the color of the face and the hands and the movement this can be remembered in the four-part acronym form shine shadow and brilliance here i have now resolved the issue of the beret being shiny and the things on my arms and i've now covered my arms the only problem is here is i now have this triangle part here and my face which is quite visible so we've now fixed the problem of the skin colored part around my neck i've used here a scrim net which is a british invention it's a piece of fabric with a load of holes cut in um, these were used quite often by British soldiers during the Second World War in order to cover the neck and to break up the shape of the body. Uh, the Dutch soldiers quite enjoyed using these because there was a lot of them surplused after the Second World War. In order to fix the issue with the face, I would need to use camouflage cream. This comes in the form of a stick. This is a US example from the Vietnam War. It has two colours on. It has green at this end and brown or loam as it is often referred to. In the 1985 Carter Manual and in the 1985 Handbook for the Soldier, it does also state that you can use the end of a cork that has been burnt or a mixture of Norit and Nivea. Now, Norit is an activated charcoal that you could get prescribed by your unit's medic. I've now put the camouflage cream on my face. As you can see, I've gone for a large block of brown interspersed with blocks of green. In the manual, it does state that you need to have large circular pa patches or you need to have large blobs of colour on your face. This is because you don't get tiger stripes in nature, um, particularly in North Germany and the Netherlands, you get large areas of brown fields with green fields in between. That's why they tended to use the loam and the green coloured camouflage sticks. You do occasionally see troops using the black, will do just enough to cover their face or they will do um, they will keep their eyes separate. I unfortunately have the uh, issue in that I have to wear glasses, so I cannot get rid of the, the issue of the shine there. However, I can use the, gray, the brown and the green to cover as much of my face as is possible. As you can see here, I don't stand out as much when I'm out in the field, but there are a few things that I can do to improve this. What I have done now is I've put my parka on. Now what this does is it does break up the shape of the body a bit. Now if I was in the field, I obviously wouldn't be standing out here in just this, this. I would also have my webbing and my helmet on as well. Now that I have my webbing on, as you can see, it does produce a slight problem in that a lot of the equipment here is quite round and quite square. It produces a bit of an issue when in nature you don't get very many perfectly round and perfectly square items. This is where we have to look at the terrain around us in order to create a camouflage that allows us to blend in. As you can see here, I've used the natural terrain to break up my shape. I've added bits of foliage into the helmet and I've added pieces of foliage to the square small pack on the back, which will allow me to break up my shape. In addition, I've also put it running down the back of my helmet and around the sides to break up the shadow on the rim of the helmet. It's really important if you move into a different terrain that you look at the camouflage that you have on you um, to determine whether that is the best camouflage for that terrain. This is now a good example of even though I have followed all those principles, 
I am standing in a different environment, therefore I will have to tailor my camouflage to the environment that I am in. Another really key thing to consider is not just how you physically look, but how you interact with the environment around you. What I am doing now is commonly referred to as silhouetting, because you can still see the silhouette of my body against the backdrop. In order to prevent this, getting as low down to the ground as possible will increase your chances of remaining unseen. If you do have to interact with the environment, meaning that you have to look through it, the best way to do so is to actually look through the environment rather than over the top of it. If I stand here, or I kneel here, and I'm trying to observe the enemy, I'm silhouetting myself. If I move a matter of a few feet in the next direction, you now cannot see where I am, but I have almost complete vision of where the enemy can be. Another key element is how you actually walk across the environment. If I walk between this tree and the next tree, and I trudge my way through, you can hear my footsteps. What it states in the manual is to roll your foot going toe to heel, like so. This also allows you to check for tripwise for booby traps or any landmines that may be underfoot. You can also do is to crawl across the environment to keep your silhouette low and keep yourself as low down to the ground as possible. The important thing to consider when you are crawling is to make sure that your the muzzle of your weapon stays out of the dirt. If any dirt or anything gets inside this or the working part, it could cease the weapon from functioning. The best way to do this when you're crawling is to keep your rifle like so or like so to keep it out of the mud. Additionally, with an Uzi, you can fold this up much smaller to keep it much closer into your body like so. Mm.